so my my major was really biochemistry and i wanted to expand on that um and not limit myself to just microbiology so i went to the university of california and um and did my postdoc for two years at the university of california in the biochemistry department um and while i was there that's when i got interested in tai chi i uh, was under a lot of pressure uh it it was Make probably the, the number one biochemistry department in the world at that time. And there was a lot of competition uh, and a lot of pressure to publish and write grants. And so I was searching around for a way to relax, but at the same time, get some exercise. And during that period, I was studying a, a bit about uh, Eastern culture and religion. And I started reading the I Ching and uh, started learning something about Taoism and um and that was theory about uh, and their their view of the, uh, of the of the universe um and of course i learned about tai chi through that and uh because tai chi uh manifests their basic philosophy of uh all things being connected and uh and that uh you know change is a good thing and that uh uh, opposites are good, good, and they uh, harmonize uh, each other. So I was, I was attracted to those kinds of concepts, and so I uh, heard about Tai Chi, uh, and I searched around for a Tai Chi teacher, and I, lo and behold, there wasn't anyone really in the East Bay. Um, all the Tai Chi masters seemed to be congregated in uh, downtown Chinatown in San Francisco. Uh, and but at that time, BART was being built. It, it hadn't yet been completed. I think it was a couple of years before they opened wow. uh, in the mid seventies. Uh, so getting to San Francisco three to five times a week to train uh, was uh, wouldn't wouldn't work out with uh, my very busy and high pressured uh, uh, schedule. So um, uh, at that time, the leading Tai Chi master in San Francisco, but was a man by the name of the Grand Master uh, in Tai Chi by the name of uh, Kuo Lian. Um, uh, and he emigrated to Chinatown back, I think in the, in, the, in the early 60s. At that time he was 80 years old or so and he had kind of stopped teaching and he had mostly his students doing the teaching and he was married and his wife was much younger and she was also a Tai Chi master. Um, but anyway, uh, so I went there uh, and I asked him if he could rec recommend somebody, if he knew anybody in the East Bay. And he said, yes, as a matter of fact, a protege of mine by the name of, um, his name was Y.C. Chang, uh, had just emigrated from Taiwan and decided to take up residence in Oakland. Um, and so I, I got uh, in contact, touch with him. He didn't speak a word of English. It was just new off the boat, basically. Um, and he set up a school, and uh, interestingly, uh, a, a lot of uh, Master Kuo Lian's students uh, came to the East Bay to study under uh, Y.C. Chang. He was much younger, and he was very active in, tr in the training process, whereas, as I mentioned, Kuo Lian at that time it caught us, was in semi-retirement. And so a lot of the best students of Kuo Lian went to study under uh, Y.C. Chang, uh, who was who, who was um, uh, Kuo Lian's protege, uh, and so uh, I was one of those students, and most of the other students had a lot more experience than I had. So uh, I, it it took me a while to catch up, but I worked really hard at it, and I became really fascinated with uh, with Tai Chi and and the, and the entire system and the philosophy. Um, and I studied with with him for a couple of years. Um, back in the old days, the the Tai Chi masters were masters in many in other arts besides Tai Chi, uh, notably in Chinese medicine and uh, and art. Uh, things have changed these days with the specialization. So that's how I got into it. Uh, and uh, uh, I just basically been practicing all my life, um, even though I've moved to live in, in different places. Um, yeah, so so that's how I got into it. So at that time, you were, you were in your probably early mid-20s, right? 
No, I was at the time, uh, that was in 74. Thank you very much. Uh, <laughs> I'm older than that. Um, no, I was I was about thirty one or thirty two at the time. But you were still relatively young, and were you doing it mostly for you said stress? So it was like mental and emotional health and clarity. What were the benefits yeah. for you at that point in your life? Yes, at, at that time I was under a lot of stress uh, and pressure, and. Um, uh, like I say, was searching around for some kind of activity that would um, give me both, uh, bo excuse me, both exercise and uh, and relaxation. And, uh, you know, Tai Chi is known as a form of moving meditation. Uh, that's, that's one of the um, uh, nice things about Tai Chi when you compare Tai Chi to other forms of exercise that people do, especially in the West such as lifting weights and doing calisthenics, not only do you get exercise, but you get, you, but it relaxes your mind. Um, so you get a double benefit out of it. Um, tai Chi, uh, most people don't realize this, but Tai Chi is really classified as a sport. Uh, you know, it, it takes energy to do Tai Chi. You know, it's not a passive activity. Um, and people that do Tai Chi, they train like any other sport. And as a matter of fact, Tai Chi is the most popular sport in the world. There are more people doing Tai Chi than play soccer, football, baseball, or any other sport. Huh. So how would you say personally the benefits of doing or having a Tai Chi practice have changed through your life cycle, through your, you know, um, just, you know, your body, how it's changed, helped? Well, that's an interesting question. Um, I have there. I have gone like many people, maybe if not most people, gone through periods of my life where I was under a great deal of stress, and I've always been able to fall back on my Tai Chi practice and really um, focus even more intently on my practice, and it's it's really helped me through uh, those difficult periods. And that's one of the reasons why I'm really passionate about teaching Tai Chi, especially to seniors. Um, and I feel that there's so many benefits to it, uh, both for uh, mental health and physical health, uh, that it. Um, uh, I feel I feel compelled to, in effect, in a way, to 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 pass it on to people, because I think it's really a gift. How much do you think Tai Chi? has helped you maintain so much fluidity and dexterity, just physically? Well, fortunately, I, I came from a lineage, studied under a lineage that really stressed physical health. And what I mean by that is before we even started training uh, and doing the movements, the forms, we did a lot of stretching exercises. And so I learned a system of stretching exercises uh, some of them are related to um, uh, Qigong, but um, these are these are really ancient uh, stretching exercises that go back, at least can be traced back to probably the early, uh, the beginning of the uh, 19th century, at least, maybe even longer than that. And uh, these, these, these exercises are designed to stretch the tendons and elongate the joints. And the tendons are very important in physiology because they connect the bone to the muscle. And when we get older, the tendons start to contract. And that's why you see a lot of older people that have a kind of contracted kind of composure. Mm -hmm. and, they, and that affects your whole, your whole system. Uh, it affects your posture, the way you stand, you know, your spine and everything else. And once everything starts getting out of alignment, things start going downhill really quickly. And uh, then it starts affecting your internal organs because if your posture is bad, it puts a lot of pressure on your internal organs. The availability of oxygen get to those to those uh, to those tissues to aerate those tissues, and um, uh, and to basically we don't think of exercising uh, things that are inside of us, our, our tissues and our organs, but they need exercise just like our muscles need exercise.
And so, in fact, one of the values of doing uh, Qigong is that it squishes blood in and out of your internal organs. Uh, so I, I don't know but uh, for sure, but I think that probably has contributed uh, to my, uh, uh, you know, my being in pretty good health at my age. I'm still, be, I'm still able to do everything I was able to do even more so than I was be, uh, be, before I started uh, learning Tai Chi. Um, and, uh, you know, some of the low movements that I practice, I can get down even lower than I, than I did a few years ago. So, so even at my age, I seem to be progressing and getting better at it than, um, than kind of going the other way. Hmm. Um, so I don't know if that answers your question. Yeah, no, it does. So, okay. So tell me, when did you start teaching Qigong and how has your audience, your students, how has that changed over the years? Um, well, my, my teaching, uh, I was practicing uh, pretty seriously, trainings pretty seriously. Uh, my training actually uh, accelerated uh, beyond Tai Chi into the other uh, Chinese internal martial arts about 10 years ago. But Back then, I was uh, it was about twelve. I guess about twelve years ago, or so. Uh, I was just doing I was Kuang Pi Yang style, which is the original Yang style that that Y C Cheng uh, and Kuo Lian taught me. Um, and I was caretaking my mother in Naples, Florida. She was in a an assisted living facility, and uh, so I spent a lot of time over there, and I kind of got to know a lot of the people that were work working there, and. Um, just hanging around there. I'd never really been around seniors before, even though I was getting on to an age where I was a senior. Um, I kind of don't look at myself as a as a senior. I feel young, you know. And but anyway, um, I noticed that so many people there had so many so much difficulty uh, walking, and their balance was uh, really uh, really bad. And a lot of those people were infirm because they had recently fallen and some of them were in the hospital and never recovered. And um, I just thought um, it would be interesting to teach a, a Tai Chi to some of these people. And so as an experiment, I asked if they would let me, uh, you know, just do a, a, a Tai Chi demo. And uh, we just, uh, they got together a group of, there was a lot of interest. There were about 20 or 30 people who uh, joined the group. And I could tell right away that it probably wouldn't be a good idea to teach them standing Tai Chi, that is the form uh, moving around uh, because of uh, some of the serious mobility issues that most of them had. So I tried to teach it sitting down and we did some Qigong and some just basic Tai Chi exercises. And a lot of people came up to me and told me that it was very helpful. Most if not all of those people had never been exposed to anything like that. It was really relatively easy for them to do. So um, I went home with a kind of mission to explore that um, as something you know to do. I was retired at the time. I was an avid windsurfer uh, was a, and I was playing tennis and doing a lot of you know uh, Tai Chi, but I had lots of time to do voluntary, the volunteer work. And so I started volunteering, teaching Tai Chi at, I don't know if you're familiar with um, Satellite Affordable Housing Authority. Oh. They have um, uh, senior housing in um, all over the Bay Area. I think they probably have about 15 uh, places. And a lot of them are, are centered in, in uh, the Chinatown area of Oakland. And so I started doing volunteer work for them and teaching classes at, uh, I think I taught classes at three or four of their uh, their their places, and um, then I I just kind of started looking around to do it professionally, and I started getting work, uh, I was starting getting paid to do it, and I uh, I was I worked at three or four community centers, including um, Orinda and in uh, Berkeley North and South community centers. Um, I got a job teaching at Bax. I don't know if you're familiar with them. They're still around. It's it's called the Bay Area 
um, see uh, something I can't remember uh, what it stands for, but it's a organization that uh, provides kind of like daycare centers for uh, people, uh, older people with dementia. Uh -huh. And I taught a class there um, for about a year, a little over a year, and it was one of my best classes. Those people really enjoyed it. I had about 40 students. Um, and then I taught at uh, adult schools. Uh, you know, and, and looking back, I've had so much experience teaching so many different kind of people that I became really, really good at um, figuring out exactly what they needed and tailoring a class to meet people's needs. So, you know, there's no use teaching something uh, that people can't do or comprehend, right? Even if it's good that they learn it. Um, and so I've been able to uh, modify uh, various styles to meet the needs of, you know, an organization or a group of people. Um, so teaching Tai Chi to people with dementia is a lot different than teaching Tai Chi to people with, uh, let's say, stroke victims. And I have taught people with, uh, uh, in stroke clinics as well. I might as well mention that. Um, and it's different for, for teaching uh, uh, teaching people uh, in um, who, who lack mobility, people in wheelchairs, certain other disabilities, right? Um, so, uh, we're st I'm starting up a program through, uh, sponsored by BORP to teach seated Tai Chi, um, actually over Zoom, to people who are visually impaired and blind. And so you can imagine that that, that kind of program would be very different uh, than teaching Tai Chi to people who want to learn Tai Chi for self-defense purposes. So you, um, you started teaching at BORP in Berkeley before COVID, and it wasn't a seated class. I remember going a few times in person. And then when with COVID, um, you modified the class for a seated audience. Tell me about that transition. Was it difficult or pretty seamless? Well, that's an interesting question. Um, actually, I remember, Leslie, I remember you in that class. Mm -hmm. I remember you being very, really a really good student too and really picking it up. Um, but actually I did teach sit sitting Tai Chi there for a few years. Oh, you did? Uh, huh. Yeah, at work, I taught it for, to, for the, I had a group of people who were in wheelchairs who, who couldn't stand. Uh, so that's where I kind of got my, experience uh, trying to adapt uh, Tai Chi to the seated, seated position. And at that time I chose the sun system where there are basically four main uh, styles of Tai Chi and sun system is the newest, but it's also the most gentle one. And um, it's perfect, uh, it can be perfectly adapted to the seating position because the stepping routines in sun style are very simple. It's just step forward and come back and bring your back leg up in uh, just behind the heel of the front leg. And that's all there is to it. So uh, whereas stepping, there's there's very complicated stepping styles in some of the other styles like, uh, 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 I mean, stepping routines in some of the other styles like Chen and Yang style. Um, and so I, um, I ended up teaching mostly mostly to, to seniors and certainly at Bohr, uh, the sun style system that was modified by Dr. Paul Lamb um, of the um, Tai Chi for Health Institute. And he took the sun style and he made it even more, more um, friendly uh, for older people. Uh, yeah, so most of, my, most of my teaching practices, teaching practice is focused on using the sun style for seniors and for people with disabilities. Yeah, well, uh, Qigong is uh, translated as energy work. Qi, energy, gong, work. And um, Qigong is, is actually quite different than Tai Chi, but it, um, it, uh, it precedes Tai Chi. Qigong could, some people think Qigong is, uh, the people were doing Qigong back in the Stone Age. So there's some, um, 
there's some um, evidence, uh, there's some written evidence that um, in cave paintings and, and, and the like and such that uh, people were actually doing Qigong back then. And um, for centuries, it was thought that if you practice Qigong uh, intently and very seriously, that you it would lead to an immortality, that you live forever. Well, I don't know if that's true, but um, the main difference between Qigong and Tai Chi is that Qigong is done in more or less statically. It's a, there's, they're not, it's just a variety of probably over a thousand different exercises that you don't do in any particular order. Whereas Tai Chi is our movements that are strung together in a particular order. Uh, it has to be done in that order. In, and it's in, in, uh, to take the form of a set. So we talk about Tai Chi sets. The set can be anywhere from 12 movements, 24 movements, 48, they're usually in uh, groups of eight, 64 and higher, depending on the style. Uh, and in Qigong, Qigong, it's the breath. Um, it's the breath that leads the movement. And so as you breathe, the breathing um, the, the dictates how the movement actually happens. Where in, in Tai Chi, you don't really think about the breath. It more or less happens on its own. And so the movement leads the breath. And so there's the breath, breathing and breath work is, is much more important in Qigong than it is in Tai Chi. And breath work is very important for health. Um, a lot of people prefer to, to, to do Qigong because they don't have to remember a series of four in a set. And I know that uh, I have classes that I've taught for years at the same students. And once in a while, I ask them if they want to go ahead and do the set for me. And they, they, they walk away, you know, they, <laughs> They smile and say, no, 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 I, I can't do it. And they just like to watch me do it and, and to follow me. Uh, and I, I've always thought that's that's really interesting is that I, I never had trouble memorizing the forms because to me, they led, they, they melded into each other in a very natural way. Um, so you end one posture in a, you end one form in a posture that lends itself perfectly to continuing on in another posture and so on and so forth. Um, so it's kind of like a set, like a, a phrase. A, a phrase is made up of a series of words. And the words are not just random, right? They're not random. It would be impossible to memorize them. But because they have a meaning, mm -hmm. it's easy to remember the order of the words in the phrase. So it's kind of something like that uh, for me. Mm -hmm. So um, I, I could amplify that a little bit more. A little bit more. You can break down uh, uh, Tai Chi, as I, as I mentioned, into at least four different styles, uh, from very soft to, to hard, hard meaning uh, physically demanding. Um, and if you look deeper than that, um, Tai Chi is only one of the three internal Chinese martial arts that, that people who are serious uh, study and learn. And uh, two others are Bagua and um, and something called uh, Xing Yi, H S I N G Y I. Uh, Yi means mind, and uh, Xing I think means form. Or and Yi the other the other um, uh, translation of, of of Yi is is intention. And so when people talk about the mind. In Chinese, they think of the mind forming it, the mind forms intention. So it's kind of natural, they're synonymous. And um, Xing Yi is, uh, you might translate it as intentional, intentional form because it's you know, your mind, actually in all the internal Chinese martial arts, the mind creates intentions and then the body carries out that intention. It, the intention could be to deflect. The intention could be to withdraw, could be to to step aside. Um, it could be, the intention could be to make contact and stick to somebody to feel where their energy is coming from so that you can react accordingly. And Xing Yi and Bagua are very different than Tai Chi, but they're based on exactly the same principle hmm. of non-resistance. Kind of letting your body uh, 
react uh, naturally. Um, in Tai Chi, you uh, you work from the middle of a circle out in, in eight different directions. In Xing Yi, it's very linear. You just go back and forth. And uh, in Bagua, you walk a circle. In fact, it was derived, Bagua was derived from the ancient art of the ancient practice of circle walking. And then someone figured out how to turn it into a martial art. And it's a beautiful, uh, wonderful practice. It's my favorite. Uh, and you hold various um, uh, upper body and arm and hand postures as you walk the circle, turning inside and outside of the circle. And the idea in that art is that the um, the adversary is in the middle of the circle and you're defending yourself from the perimeter of a circle, turning inside and outside of the circle. And so the geometries of, of all these different um, internal Chinese martial arts are very different, but they're very harmonious. And if you study all three of them, like I have, uh, you get, um, you, you delve down into a much deeper understanding of the individual ones because they're so, they're related and yet different, uh, but they're based on the same principles. Well, I'd like how you give us a taste of all of it in the class. Put my, you know, pretend I'm a senior, really am anyway, and say, how can I modify this to extract the best, the benefits of each of these things? Because Ching Yi gives you a tremendous amount of feeling of power and energy. And um, uh, especially internally. And uh, that's really important, especially for, for seniors because they very often, they feel vulnerable, right? Mm -hmm. uh, and and Bagua, there's nothing better than Bagua for developing a sense of balance because you're walking a circle and focusing your attention on the inside of the circle as you're walking the circle and turning inside and out of the circle. And so Bagua circle walking is phenomenal for developing uh, skills, uh, balance skills. Uh, even much more than running or even walking. If you're walking, you're just walking, you know, basically doing the same thing over and over again and not really turning, uh, uh, you know, uh, abruptly, mm -hmm. which, which is why people fall mm -hmm. and stumble, right? Because they're turning abruptly. So I've taught, I have a class that I call Bagua for Better Balance. Mm -hmm. And I've tried teaching it a few times. I've, uh, I've, I've taught it a few times. Um, and never really caught on. Uh, and I think it's because it's not as sophisticated and complex as Tai Chi. So Tai Chi holds people's interest more. Mm -hmm. It's a little bit boring walking around a circle unless you're using it to meditate. So, which is not something that most people in the West do very well. Uh, so I'll leave it at that. <laughs> <laughs> I think I... I have covered all of my questions and more. What else would you want people to know, especially people who are living with a chronic health condition or other physical disability? What would you want them to know about the benefits of a Tai Chi, Qigong, or Bagua practice? Okay, well, that's a really good question. Um, so some of the some of the benefits of Tai Chi that are lesser known, and the, the number one I would say, number one is it it infuses a um, uh, it's like getting a shot of self esteem, and you practice Tai Chi, uh, you it empowers people, uh, and um, I think that I think that's important especially for. It's important for everybody, really, but it's especially for people uh, with, um, uh, you know, with certain issues. And um, um, so, the, yes, this empowerment uh, is something I see often. Um, and also, the, it, I see it, an improvement in um, what's, what's called ambidexterity. And the reason for that is that in Tai Chi, you do everything right-handed and left-handed. Unlike a lot of other sports, you think of baseball, you know, you th usually you throw a ball with your right hand or your left hand, you bat right hand or left handed, you run around the bases, clock counterclockwise, not clockwise. And, you know, football is, you know, pretty much the same thing. So, um, uh, 
So amb ambidexterity is a really important uh, in, um, in moving around our world, right? Because our world isn't right-handed or left-handed. And so we need to be able to make decisions and do things uh, comfortably in both in both those dimensions. Um, and by practicing Tai Chi, it happens almost naturally. Um, the third thing I would say is, is it in, which is I see in in every student that I that I've ever had stays with it long enough, is an, an increased awareness, an increased awareness of not only themselves and where they are in time and space, but in other people. Um, there are many other health benefits associated with Tai Chi practice. So, uh, one I've mentioned is, is, is reducing stress. I've mentioned improving balance. Um, it's docu well documented that it can lower, uh, decrease hypertension. Uh, I certainly have experienced that myself. I, being a scientist, I, there, it was a period of time when I, I, I had an operation and came out of it uh, with a bit of high blood pressure. And I was able to lower my blood pressure within 15 minutes by 20 or 30 points simply by doing a, a five or 10 minutes of Qigong. And I teach that Qigong. It's a Wudang Qigong exercise. Uh, I teach it almost at, at all of my classes at the beginning of the class. Uh, and I was able to plot the, um, the results out on a graph. And it's, the, the results are really impressive. Um, a lot of people in our in our society suffer from hypertension. It's very common. Uh, there's some evidence that Tai Chi potentiates the immune system, uh, and uh, I also mentioned that um, it's an excellent exercise for uh, elongating the joints and um, and exercising the tendons, stretching the tendons. Um, 